When the tech world is struggling with gender diversity, we have a woman leading Roby towards our digital future as our CTO, Perihen, or shall we say Perihen Appa. Today, we're going to learn about all her life and how she became a power woman in technology. Thank you, Susanna, for such an introduction. Frankly speaking, I never thought about it. So maybe for the first part, you can say Perihen. I know that there is Perihan Appu <laughs> and Appa and D, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. But it's okay for Perihan only, it's fine. Okay. Uh, now, if I come to your, uh, let's say, main uh, point regarding this uh, woman in technology, frankly speaking, I never thought about it. It came, let's say, uh, naturally. Okay. Because, and maybe this is the reason why I always been asked this question, but I have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your childhood? Were you always a very good student or did you create a lot uh, am, of trouble? Uh, let's say I am a single uh, child, not single child, but majority of my life I was a single child and then I got my brother when I was uh, maybe <laughs> uh, 20s. Uh, but uh, I was always living in a family, having my cousins, so we were all together and they are exactly like my uh, brothers and sisters. So I have never felt I don't have brothers and sisters. So. Uh, I, uh, let's say I was a normal child, maybe being the elder, I was always, uh, you know, taking the, how to say, the lead among, like, the, the gang among my cousins. So I was always the one pushing them to do something here or doing something there. Uh, this is what I can remember. But uh, all in all, it was um, more or less, uh, how to say, um, uh, normal, normal childhood, nothing to point out. Okay, so you did not do any like mischievous things in your childhood? Uh, no, normal things like beating my cousins, uh, you know, <laughs> taking their things sometime or uh, for example, doing something like uh, tricky. Like for example, I was reading too much and uh, I was reading, you know, this uh, uh, children book for adventure. So small people who are doing certain adventure or certain tricks here and there. So I was always trying to repeat this uh, tricks for example, like uh, trying to write with this invisible uh, ink, doing letters, trying to lock myself into a room and then trying to push the key under a paper uh, and try to get it. And of course, I was locked down the whole day in this room without uh, being able to go out. And that's it, not, uh, not too much. Also, I remember that uh, sometimes I was taking my, uh, I don't know if this is good to say this or not, but sometimes I was taking my mother's uh, I believe not jewelry, but let's say this fake jewelry and trying to sell them. <laughs> <laughs> so you did a lot of mischievous things. I, I don't know, now you are calling it like this, but at this time I did not recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so since we heard a little bit about your childhood, so how did you transition into your career? Like, did you already always know that you were going to go into technology? Uh, frankly speaking, you know, as per uh, during the school time, I don't know, maybe it's a similar also during this education. You need to select, I believe, in the secondary, Uh, yes. that you need to select either you will go but I was always not um, on the science side the only choice that I have to do should I go for the medical uh, let's say uh, study or for the engineering study and uh, frankly speaking I decided to go for engineering because during this uh, I did it uh, for one specific reason because I found that in order to be a successful doctor at least in my country your uh, your father and all your family need to be a doctor. <laughs> so at this stage, I took this decision. So I was always even answering this question, why I selected the engineering uh, side, because I found that in order to be successful, I need my father to be a doctor and maybe my grandfather to be a doctor. So I'm just continuing their uh, path. That's why I selected to be an engineer. Okay, so um, when did you join the telecom you know, industry? Uh, I will also tell you, actually, in my time, I did not know anything about the telecom. Actually, I was looking for a job like any, uh, anyone else. And then uh, I was playing uh, basketball. Wow. I was in the, in the main team in one of the sporting, uh, let's say, club in Egypt. And then one of my uh, colleagues, he told me there is a company called Siemens looking for people. So I told him, what is this Siemens? What should I do? Then he told me, do, go there and drop your CV. <laughs> so I went and I dropped my CV. And then they selected me among other uh, five colleagues who were also my colleagues during the university. So I went there and we were all knowing each other. And it was actually a very good initiative for all young people or all graduated people at this time. 
because they wanted to get uh, people to work and it was uh, a kind of cooperation between Siemens and the government to do a big project where they are taking new graduates and they are going to, uh, let's say, to scale them up across all their uh, career. So I was one of the selected uh, during this time. Okay, so we'll, we learned a few things about your career. So tell us a little bit about your family now. Actually, as I told you, I am, uh, uh, let's say, I, I have always lived in a family house. So I am, till now I am looking, I'm not married, so I am looking care for my uh, parents. And I'm still living with them in this family house, having everyone there, and uh, that's it. That must and be... also I am having my uh, nephew, I am taking care of them, because... It, it's, it must be really nice to have, like, you know, take care of your nephew. Yes. Like, babies are always like a joy. You know? They are yeah. a kind of, you know, seven and six years old. Oh, little. Yes. So, um, since we talked a little bit about your personal life, now I'm going to talk a little bit about your professional life, if that's okay. So, um, do you think that we have the best uh, network, data network in the country, in Bangladesh? Uh, and how do you think we compare with our competitors? Okay, maybe if you talk about this point, maybe first to, uh, we need to understand something. There is nothing called best network. Yes. This is something that we need all to understand. Because if we go even, I will not mention their names, but if you look to Ruby and the other two competitors, everyone has his area where he is strong, and then his area where he is competing with others, and then his area where maybe he is second or third. So this is normal across the board. So we should first understand that there is nothing called best network. But maybe the differentiation, but maybe there is one operator who is able to differentiate than the others. So the more we are able to differentiate into our customer offering and maybe into our, let's say, technology level, I believe this is where we will be leading. Right. So as we all know that we have the highest population coverage of 4G network right now. What is the secret to that? Uh, no, actually the 4G coverage, it's not a secret. The 4G coverage, we need to consider it as a DNA. We have to have the 4G coverage in order to be able to provide the 4G service. And then on the top of this, uh, let's say, DNA, we need now to excel in different, uh, let's say, service, in different offering to the customer. So we can, let's say, maintain our leadership position. Right. So we also know that uh, we have recently acquired some new spectrum, right? So where will be where will we be deploying this additional spectrum, and how long do you think we can see the uh, like the results in improving the network no, quality? I believe we have already deployed our uh, spectrum. We have deployed it in many areas. So the spectrum, it's like also we need to look to the spectrum as a kind of capacity solution. So for example, in this area, I need to provide more capacity from network point of view, so I am deploying Spectrum. It's not that you go and deploy it across the board. You, you will have the demand, and then based on this, you deploy the Spectrum. And just for your information, I believe we almost deployed it everywhere. So I could say that we have achieved maybe 80 to 90% implementation for our uh, Spectrum that we have purchased uh, in, on Marsh. That is wonderful news. So um, as a CTO, what do you think was the most innovative initiative that was taken by the technology division? I would not uh, go into the initiative. I believe the initiative in technology, it's not uh, once. We are living this initiative every day. <laughs> so every day we need to find uh, some initiative in order to face, uh, let's say, whatever challenge we are having in the industry. So it goes without saying, we started, you know, with technology as is. Now we are moving maybe to 4G, to 5G. We are doing this transformation across the technology, either in spectrum, either in our mindset, either in our required skills. So actually, maybe the biggest achievement that we are able always to be adaptive to whatever is happening in the industry. And I believe the secret to our team that we have this adapt, adapt, adapt to be adaptive in a quick manner. I believe this is, could be one of our key or success factors. Okay, that's wonderful. So um, we know that in the NCCD areas, we're trying to beef up the network quality. So uh, what do you think, like how can we take initiatives to compete with the market leaders over there? No, actually we are already competing with the market leader in NCCD. I could say that we are delivering now the quality of service like, uh, for example, 10 Mbps in certain area, maybe some sector even are transmitting 22 Mbps in certain area. So actually our existing uh, network in NCCD now, in, in many uh, spots, it's above uh, even the leader or the market uh, leader if we look into it in this area. 
and we are still continuing. So it's not that we are still to achieve it, but we have achieved it. Or at <laughs> least we have achieved news. 80 to 90 percent of it. Okay, that is good news. So, uh, Perihan, so what do you think is the future for technology landscape in Bangladesh? I mean, I believe Bangladesh, like any other country, I believe we need to look to what we are calling digital Bangladesh. Right. So there is no way that we are not moving from 4G to 5G. And always Bangladesh, of course, as a big country, I believe they will not be, uh, how to say, outdated. They will reach this soon. Even they will reach it very soon. Because now it's pushed not only by, uh, let's say, by a country you wish, but it's also push, pu pushed or the movement to technology, it's also pushed by people. Because the need and the demand of the people is becoming bigger and bigger, which will, uh, how to say, mandate this movement. And I believe that it will be in very soon. It will not be late. Okay, so Perihan, since we talked a lot about your professional life, now I want to know from you, like, since you're a woman in technology, it must like must have been a very difficult journey because we don't see too many women in technology sector even though that is changing now so will you share with us some of the difficulties or challenges you might have faced okay let me be, be very frank first i have never felt it so i have never felt that as i am the only woman in a technology department however it was the real fact that i was always now when you say it I recognize that I was the only woman in the technology department across different, let's say, careers. But also, I have to also recognize that all my colleagues were always supporting me. So this is also something, and they never looked to me like less or something like this. And uh, I remember that uh, in my first job, uh, when we were like four people, and they were given, you know, the activity, going to the site, uh, doing a change, working on the telecom area. And I was giving like a job working on, you know, I would say on like the IT and LAN network. So after a month, I was always complaining to my boss that I want to go with my colleagues. Why they are going and traveling across the network and doing here and there, installing something called the MC sites. And I am not. Then I had an agreement with him that for one year, I will do my job and their job. And if I succeed, he will move me uh, to their job. And Alhamdulillah, I succeeded and I was moved with them. Otherwise, I will never be here. <laughs> that was very interesting. <laughs> okay, so uh, you, uh, the, I think this is your first time in Bangladesh, like uh, after Bangladesh, right? Yes, in Robi? yes, this is my So first you came time. in Bangladesh in 2013, as you said yes, before. Yes, uh, sometime so in 2013. So how was your experience coming to Bangladesh for the first time? Did you see any similarities or differences in culture? Or? No, if you are looking to similarity between Bangladesh and Egypt, actually, I can see many similarities. Even the people are looking the same. So if you <laughs> if you travel, for example, to Egypt, no one will notice if you are a Bangladeshi or an Egyptian. Okay, okay. So the look and feel, it's the same. It's same. Also, we are sharing the same traffic. <laughs> <laughs> and also same, you know, this uh, small market like, uh, you new know, market. New Market, uh, yes, Bongo yeah. Bongo Bazaar. Uh, yeah. We are having the same. And this is also another uh, commonality. And also we are doing the same by crossing the street without looking anywhere. <laughs> so this is also another commonality. Uh, I like food okay. and I like spicy food. So that's why I have never had any problem like anyone what else. What about the people? No, I I, as I told you, I don't see any difference. So I am, I, it's like- It's I am, just like at home. It's like at home, okay. yes. Maybe just, maybe I don't understand the language. Right. Maybe this is the only thing, but I try to, you know, I try to get myself uh, around. Sometimes I understand what you are saying, but I don't recognize the word. <laughs> so maybe I- So did you pick up any Bangla words? Like- uh, I believe I know words. Acha. Acha. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Amra, I don't know, uh, always you are saying Amra, Amra while you are talking, so I believe it means we. Yes, right. Yes. yes. So I know Amra, I know also uh, Kotu and Koto, Boro. Kotu Boro. <laughs> Kotu Boro because, you know, I do shopping, so it's always Kotu Boro <laughs> because I cannot find my size. Okay. So I was saying Kotu Boro, <laughs> two things. Okay, so that was very wonderful to listen to all of your stories. So that brings us to the inter end of this interview. Do you have anything to say to our audience? Any interesting things about yourself? No, actually, I, I, uh, frankly speaking, I was a little bit, you know, not um, how to say skeptic about this interview. interview. But I believe uh, it was good to have such a chat, and also it was good to see you as well as uh, Niaz and other colleagues. So thank you for such time and I hope that uh, 
I was not too much uh, boring. You were not boring <laughs> at all. I'm sure the audience would agree to that. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this interview. Keep looking for more videos and I hope this video was very interesting to you. Thank you. Thank you.